this, you can see the heat, right? Yeah. So we're gonna go right there. here locally and uh, up your way on right? Mm -hmm. So uh, master uh, forget his damn name. Oh Balthazar. Master Balthazar is an armorer and smith and uh, he, he could be a good resource if you want to do more of this stuff locally. The other thing that you can look up is um is already on the NCA I've been wanting to get go to a local New Mexico one with him for a while. I just haven't been paying attention enough to put it on my calendar. Well, that's going to be the smart aleck because eventually you're going to get this guy that's going to end up being president of that club and he's going to be sitting there going, hey buddy, why don't you show up? <laughs> I know my husband would like to try this stuff but he wasn't able to come this year or uh, this weekend. So. Surprisingly, you can get started for not a tremendous Doing the, especially if you're working with long stock, which you'll see Batsu do quite a bit, where he's not, he doesn't necessarily have to have tongs because he's working with something long enough that it's not going to, especially if he has gloves, right, the heat's not going to work up too fast. So he, he's able to do that. And then, uh, you know, a little piece of steel that can act as an animal can be a lot of different things. I've, I've got a piece of railroad track that I've used, I've got a piece of ivy that was cut that we used. Um, and as far as the, my coal forge, which runs on the actual coal or charcoal, I got hard lines. I go through those kinds of things. I think it was a, yeah, I, a little over 100 shipped. And it's got a little That's quick, pretty interesting. Uh, air output. Yeah. It's, it's total, it's a rivet forge, is what it is. It's designed to hang up rivets. Fat rivets for construction purposes. Yeah. But it works really well. Uh, for small project stuff, the propane forges, you know, can, can be costly, but you can also, de if your husband's handy, if you're handy, yeah. DIYing it is not impossible. How long does that one uh, can of propane last you in this forge? Is it like a day thing? Or? On this forge, um, if we're running it all day and we're running it very hot and heavy, yeah, we might go through a how many burners you have and how well insulated your village is and what you're trying to set it for. So right now, um, it has a, it's a reduced atmosphere. Yes. So if you look at the front, you'll actually see what's called the dragon's breath coming out of it where yeah. the flame's actually coming through. That means that there is, it doesn't have enough oxygen inside the forge to actually burn everything. So it comes out and then it's igniting and doing more. So that's very good for knife making because you don't want oxygen introduced into your steel yeah. at a high temperature because then it oxidizes or rusts, and that's why you see this fire scale coming from. Yeah. And so knife makers really like these kinds of uh, this kind of atmosphere. If you're going for high efficiency, you wouldn't want any uh, dragon's breath because you'd want them all to be in that neutral flame. Yeah. And that's what most blacksmiths really, really like is that. And then there's some benefits for oxidizing, but very, very few. But um, by balancing how you want to set it up, and I can turn up the gas and push more in and get it hot enough. 
uh, a lot of people will try and claim, well, you know, a propane forge is that great if you can't get it hot enough to pour it well. That's you can get true. a propane forge hot enough to melt your steel. So you can get it hard enough to forge well. Done, done that. Um, my opinion is a propane forge is like a automatic uh, car. Ah. You set, you, you turn it on, it runs at what it's set at, and as long as you don't mess anything up, it's going to be consistently doing what you need. And you can buy propane at any gas station any day of the week, and it's very easy to get a hold of. A coal forge is much more like a, a station. There's a lot of really cool things you can do. You can dial it in, you can do amazing things with it, yeah, but if you don't know how to work it, it's going to be a bit of a problem. Well, you get cold spots in a cold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you definitely have to. It takes practice. So, since you're standing around, I'm going to kind of start my usual spiel of how we do these guys. Go ahead. It's also so, we have tip. our square steel here. Cold. Propane versus and cold. So, most people start off with square. Whenever you're drawing out or tapering, you always want to work with square. So, even if you get a round piece of saw, you're going to square it up to draw it out tapering. Because when you're trying to move, by striking and kind of pinching and pulling on each side, you're going to be able to easily control how it goes through. And then your goal is to have kind of that even color. This would be too cold for uh, a car to feel. I actually wouldn't even work my own. It's good because you're not going to get as much effort as you're going to put into it. So you're going to bring your, you bring your steel out, you set it, and your goal is to have it flat on the anvil. And the benefit of having something flat on the anvil is as you strike with this side of the hammer, your anvil is going to apply equal force, so you're actually working both sides. So when you're working something square, you're able to turn it 90 and just able to work. Now, a lot of people will try and think, well, if I want to make this a point, I really need to tilt my hammer. And if I tilt my hammer, my anvil is going to get in the way because I'm going to hit it. Just move it off the edge to where when you strike, your, your hammer can go off the edge. Now, tool selection is important, which is why I was kind of puttering around before I even started talking. One of the things you want to know is what tongs work well for what. Your tongs work best where they are parallel. So if I try and take a piece of steel that's very big, and it doesn't grab where it's parallel, you see how it creates that yeah. point. And that pivot point does not let you hold your steel accurately. Meanwhile, for the smaller piece I have, I'm able to just easily grip that. Hammer wise, you want something heavy enough that it will hit, but really, control is more important than the rest of it. So you want to pick something that you're able to control and you're able to swing. A lot of people will come in and go, well, I'm black pivoting. I need a big hammer. I need to whack as hard as I can. And they can swing it about three times. And then all of a sudden their swing goes way out here or their swing goes in and on. Yeah, you got a big divot in your piece. <laughs> so having a hammer that you can control is very important. Having something that's comfortable in the hand is important. Uh, Specialized? Did you get them in like a Tebo or? Basic hammers you can get at a lot of hardware stores, but a lot of these special pattern ones, uh, like this one and the one you had earlier, the one that's got a fatter head than a thing. It's that Swedish pattern. Anyway, there's some more specialized that come from hammer stores. But they're not they're not consciously expensive. Like this one, which is a very good card. Uh, is this Swedish pattern? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Swedish pattern from hammer. Right? It was not not going to break Or you go to flea markets yes. and you can find them relatively cheap if you just keep an eye out for regular. And a lot of hammers in a flea market situation may need to have the face redone, but the hammer's fine. It just needs it needs to be polished, you know, the condition. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's, you found it at a flea market. But, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that they're, just because they're old doesn't mean they're yeah. not useful. This is one of our favorites. French cross piece of benefit of it. That's what it was, French So when you feel the weight on it, it oh, yeah. looks like it has a bigger head versus something like this it might be a bit heavier because of where the handle is and how it feels. So you can also choke up or shift how you want. But the big thing is that you want control. And then the other thing that you'll notice is that you're not going to talk about the space. Excuse me, where's the art room one? Art room.
room one. Hold on one second. Yeah, that building right there. Okay, thank you. So if you have any divots or cracks or things on the face, that transfers in into your metal as you And you'll notice that the edges are radiused. Even on, mo on most of the anvils, the edges are radiused. That's because a sharp edge is half of a scissor. Yeah. So if you sit there and you hit something with a sharp edge, you can actually start cutting through or damaging. So I think yeah. my piece is a good temp now, so I'm just going to... There's a lot of folks that will uh, condition, a brand new animal will have to condition it to kind of get the edges they want because they're going to use it for different things. So you'll notice I'm striking on the edge, and ideally I want to just do a couple of hits, rotate 90. Ideally, I want to bring my hammer almost up to where it's by my ear when I bring it down. I don't want a death grip. The, high, the tighter you hold the hammer, the more vibration that's going to go into your hand, and the more often you're going to get blisters. So some of the old manuals and instructions actually told you that you should swing in such a way that your master could come and with two fingers pluck the hammer from your hand to show that you weren't reaching too tight. It's nice to see how good one quick pass yeah. I'm able to get it down and now again this is for demonstration purposes this isn't best technique but if I took this and I start hitting it now you'll notice one the sound is different because it's harder two you'll see hardly any change at all if you look closely as it gets colder, the harder it gets, the harder it gets, the more energy it takes to move it. So I'm not doing myself any favors by sitting there and working the steel cold. Metal's a pretty forgiving medium. Even if you do make a mistake, like hit, hit it off long and get a dent in it, there's a lot of things you can do to work that sort of thing out. But as he said, nothing can be accomplished unless there's the appropriate amount of heat. So throwing it back in the fire is never a waste of time. <laughs> if you hit too cold, you start introducing stress fractures, right? That's true. Yep. Especially if you're doing something that's spring steel or something that's high carbon, you can actually damage it to the point that it's not going to be as efficient as it once was. Um, now, what we're doing here is blacksmithing. It's called blacksmithing mostly because the oxide that comes off of it is black. That's what we work with. A very common concept is another one called white smithing. Also jewelry work, so usually anything that was white metal, originally silver, it's now becomes where it goes over all jewelry. There were red smiths that worked more with copper and brass from, and then there were a couple that worked with different ones, the gold smiths are their own. You'll notice a lot of them will actually take their pieces, work them cold, and then they anneal them. They set them and they heat them to a critical temperature, then let them cool, and that kind of resets its chemical or its molecular structure, resets the clock, so that you can work it differently. Is um, there a danger with working the metal too hot? You can burn steel in certain types, of, like uh, the uh, wrought iron and then stuff like that. If you if you if you you can burn. High carbon steel will also carbon. turn into a sparkler. Yeah. Um, and then you can also have, uh, you can get it hot enough to where you puddle it and actually do melt it. You don't want to uh, turn it off, in other words, yeah, it's too hot. Yeah. Less of an issue with, you know, any, any kind of uh, steel that's made for the purpose. So for the most part, your modern steels or they we know what the chemical structure is, we know what we want, so we actually build them a certain way. Most of them have a fairly nice uh, heat tolerance. Um, as a smith, if you're uh, like my master that like to strap junkyards, you actually start to feel as you're working it, okay, that's hitting too hard, that's hitting too light, and then you're like, okay, this metal likes to work hot, and this metal likes to work colder. Um, there are actually some very nice uh, historical books that are used to dismiss working with wrought iron, and so they 
have sections about how to work with this newfangled myelin seed because wrought iron would actually be worked uh, white hot. What we're working at right now would not be appropriate for wrought iron. Um, what you would usually forge weld at is what you work great with wrought iron at. And so uh, different metals work differently. Um, I had the honor of working titanium oh, that's at um, Battlemore 1. And that was in a charcoal forge Jeez. based off of a Roman uh, uh, mine. So we rebuilt the forge, had the, pro had the uh, charcoal in it, sitting there using pump bellows to get it to run. And what was really interesting about it, it and he didn't tell me what it was, it's just, okay, it's light, and it's like, okay, well, it did melt, so it's not aluminum. Um, very, very light, put it on the apple. Ping! Yep. Okay, too cold. Bring it out. Ping! Okay, too cold. Bring it out. Mush. It just, it moved like uh, warm butter. Huh. Moved everywhere, I was like, okay, mush, mush, ping! So it's working, thing with the proper working temperature was really, really narrow? Well, it, depending on the high, on the high temperature, it just didn't mush because I didn't need to put as much force with me because the first two had gone so strangely. Just the different kinds of metal, and as you work with them, you can kind of figure out how they like to work. Um, so. Now the other thing. And that's, and that's essentially, my goal is, is to be able to chit chat with other folks, figure out we want to do something, and then be able to go to my forge and play with it until we get done, you know? I'd love to make some more hinges, stuff like that. Mortigan was doing some hinges when we were still at the shop, and that was fun to help him with that. Well, but I, this stuff is super, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm Some of these techniques require some pre-cut stuff before you actually do the twist. Oh yeah? Did you do this with a wheel? Yeah, like how does this stuff work? Like where okay. some of it is, so, some of it's smooth, some of it's cut. So if we take a look at this right here. There you go. This is have from start to finish. So we start off with everything completely smooth. Then for this particular one, we cut a 90 degree, uh, about halfway through as we go through. Then you can take and you cut the little divots and did you do that with an angle grinder? Or? This one was done with an angle grinder. I want to do a sample piece with, that uses an angle grinder, a saw, and a chisel. Because actually how sharp and how wide these edges are right here mm -hmm. significantly <laughs> makes a difference in how it looks as the final piece. So if we look at this one here, this was all done with an angle grinder. And you can see how it has 
nice, consistent cuts all the way through, but they're curved at the bottom, okay? Now if we take a look at this piece, this was done with a chisel. And if you look, you can see how they're almost like little pyramids. Because as you cut, if you cut in with an angle grinder or saw, it's even all the way down. With a chisel, it kind of splits it's wider at top the pieces. The exactly. So you end up with a different look. So even though this one has the chisel across the center and then has all these 45 degree edges, it looks very different from this one, which used the same concept. The garlic sauce? Here's some homemade knot if you want to try it. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to have to try that. Um, so th this gives you a different look depending on how you want yeah, it to be at the sure. end. Now you were asking why this one looks so different. Well, I started with this piece here. And so this piece is the exact same twist done four times. This is done with only one area cut. This one is done with two areas cut. This was done with three areas cut and this one four. And as you can see with the spiral, how it's like smooth, 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 inside, inside, smooth, inside. And this one has almost all inside. This is definitely all inside. So this same concept was done to this bar right here. So this one only has the stair step on one of the four sides. This one has it on the two opposite sides. So they work, go in parallel. This one has three, one, two, three, and then smooth. And then this final one has all four sides smooth. Now you do want to be careful when you're doing something like this or um, another one of everyone's favorite, the cube or the dice twist. Mm -hmm. And the reason you want to be careful with this is because as you cut and shrink this one size, you're now taking this, I think, let's say it's half inch. It's now maybe a quarter inch in the center, so it's a lot weaker. And as you twist these, you can actually shear and break the pieces. And you can actually see in one of these right there, that piece is twisted yeah. on that line a lot more than the others. And that's because as I tried to twist the whole thing, that was a weak spot and the weaker, thinner spot twisted faster. And so it did that damage. Super neat. So how do you get like the hollow gap areas. Is this a so, forge weld? So there's a... two different ways to do that. One is exactly as you guessed. So this was made by my master, Willem the Smith. This was made out of election sign because he always liked to recycle. So he took and he cut the four pieces even and then he forge welded the ends and then he twisted it a set direction one way and then you untwist. And when you untwist, that's what allows it to open up and create kind of a basket. And then he flattened this part because he liked making these for uh, camp sets where he had like a revereware pot or a pan and he just broke off the plastic handle and then riveted this to it and then he had a nice all steel one. This one is the exact same thing but it started off as one solid piece and then I took an angle grinder, you can do it with the chisel again, and I cut all four all the way through, the way through oh, interesting. and then twisted and then untwisted. And uh, an interesting thing about this, it does depend on your stock, but for the most part, you want to go half as half back. So this was done two full times one direction and then one time back. And that helped get the spacing and proportion a little bit more correct. This is also important when you do everyone else's other favorite twist, the pineapple twist. So the pineapple twist ends up looking like this, and as you can see, it's got these little points that make it look like the inside of a pineapple. Well, what you do is you start off with a straight stalk, you slice it down the middle, and then you twist it, same thing that we did earlier. Then you uh, square it back up, and you can already start to see these little diamonds form on the corner. Then you do another cut, and then you untwist it half as many times, and that's what forces these diamonds off of the corner and into the center. And we kind of have a step-by-step, step, but I only see these two and, out right now. And do you have a sense of, like, in period, like where where and when with what you used? In period? Uh, that is very difficult to say. Um, I haven't gone that far down the research hole on them yet. Twists, I we believe, is something that's been used a lot for very, very simple decoration because once you work the steel, if you want to add anything to it, the, the quickest, cheapest way is to just throw a twist in it. Right. And then you kind of pick, okay, am I going to be using it for a handle? Am I using it for decoration where it's going to be hard on the 
hard on the hand like a fence or something or I feel like the cutting it would be, that's that's a whole next level of precision so if you feel this side here and then you feel this side here oh yeah just how you work the material now one thing that we are able to um look at very interestingly enough uh twist in order to do a twist properly it really does focus on the basics of blacksmithing number one how hot it is how even the heat is how thick it is because you want an even twist if one area is colder than another area it twists slower and that gives you an uneven twist so how <laughs> how big of an area you can twist evenly directly affects how well how tight your twist is and how it looks so with a lot of the viking pattern welded swords which some of them use twists to add some of the decoration in what they did you can actually see how wide their twists are which archaeologists and uh scientists have looked at and gone okay we can tell that their forge was about this big and able to do about this kind of heat source because that's the area that they twisted so that's helped us try and reverse engineer how they set their forge sheets and how they work. So I know that folding is definitely a thing for the Damascus pattern and stuff, mm -hmm. but is twisting a thing? Like, would you twist something and then hammer it flat? Would that change how it looks? Yes. Yeah. Um, if star you look at the, Damascus. the star pattern is the biggest example. So and is that that? Where you... if it's twisted, and um, if you look at... Jim Hersoulis's The Pattern Welded Blade, I didn't bring my copy here today, he has a very good um, picture or graphic that shows you by how far you grind into it, how it changes. The way I think of pattern welded steel is like high-end patisseries, like if you think like a Napoleon or something like that, where you have all those different layers of stuff, and then depending on how you cut into it, it shows you the different layers. Like if you have a strawberry in the middle of that thing, and you just cut, and you just get barely the tip, it just looks like a little dot. If you cut all the way through, now you can see like the little seeds and you see like the cross section of the strawberry. How you grind and expose that pattern that's underneath really does make a difference in how it goes. And uh, you can see that in, of course, the pattern welded blades and the Damascus blades. You can also see that in uh, Makamagane, which is a more uh, jewelry driven metal art because it's done with like copper and silver or gold and silver, but it uses the same techniques as pattern welding for Damascus, but it allows you to see it in a much finer way. Um, so that's better than Damascus. any of my pattern welded material. I, I like making billets. I don't yeah, really finish projects. That's, and that, that, that is generally the, like, yeah, but if you when just, I if think you of just... Damascus, that's what I generally think of. But... Mm -hmm. So the, the Ulf, or not the Ulf blade, um, the Sutton Hu blade, they actually look at it and they're pretty sure that it was a composite of at least four different bars that were twisted different ways and that's how they get the herringbone and a couple of other patterns the chevron patterns because if you have it twisted one way going one direction and then you take a piece going the of course everything's going the same way isn't it um well here's another example you have one piece that's going this way and one piece that's going that way when you grind it and you show the different layers underneath you'll have straight lines here but you'll have twisted and different lines there meanwhile if you take these two pieces and you folded this and put them next to each other you'd have one piece that's twisting this way the other piece that's twisting that way and you get your chevron pattern so there's a lot of things with that nowadays you also have some things called mosaic damascus and a couple of others that have been done in a lot of different ways to get them to look uh, unique or different. It is beautiful. But yeah. I think Raindrop and Sawtooth are two of my favorites. Raindrop is nice. Raindrop is usually what's uh, considered a random pattern in that just how you naturally work the material, it's going to come out a little different. So Raindrop, if I remember correctly, is one where you usually use a ball or use a setting so that you can put little punches all over it and then you can grind it very similar to ladder but where ladder you actually stack the pieces so that they're even and you get a consistent look at how they separate um, 
and then uh, the tooth one I've seen different ways because the most common one I've seen on that is the same as the ladder but you just basically do it at 90 degrees to where it, it instead of with on top of the pattern you're going with the pattern the, but the, I'm not sure if that's the easiest the way. thing that we uh, Thomas always like to say and has always been in my head is there's only one right way to do something in blacksmithing and that's the way that works so if you have like 10 different people that come up with 10 different ways to do the same pattern Why as long as it looks good end? Um, there's a really, uh, my friend went and saw one recently that the uh, guy was using a, uh, a hydraulic press and he custom cut the dies so that he could press them evenly. And I kept looking at it because my idea is, well, if I cut like a skull and did that and it's just welding and doing all that skull around the edge Damascus. and then just sit there and do that. Um, I don't have the piece here. Uh, Pep Gomez down in Las Cruces area is one is amazing smith does fantastic things with mosaic Damascus and he did spider web Damascus that sounds really and so what That's he the he, he was a he was a welder by trade so he did it as canister or mosaic so he sat there he took the pieces slid stock down and created this one quarter of the spider web welded the corners to hold it in place poured powdered metal down to fill the gaps. Then he forged weld the whole thing solid. Now he's got one quarter of a spider web. Cuts it, stacks the four pieces around, and now he's got a full spider web. And every now and then he did one that was different where instead of one of the quarters, he had a modified one that had a spider to hang from it. And then he did that whole thing. And Thomas uh, got a piece of that because he was gonna make it into a spindle world for his wife because she does all the spinning and whatnot. So he's like, okay, she loves spiders. So he's like, yeah. But uh, Pep also did uh, an American flag where he managed to get the different pieces well enough and then welded it all together. And the benefit of doing it as a pattern welded steel is unlike um, etching, where if you scratch it or polish it too much, you're going to actually remove the metal that it puts in the pattern. This is actually in the steel, so no matter how far you go down until you punch out the other side, that pattern is consistent the whole way through the piece of metal. Um, which is different from uh, ladder because you can't actually get yeah. far enough through ladder and raindrop. It's more of a surface. Um, the twisted ones, as we talked about, depending on how far you grind, it shifts what part it's showing as you go through it. Um, but yeah, we have a variety of different things. So like the one I showed you earlier, that one's even. This one I decided to just do a wide spot, a small spot. It just gives it a slightly different look. This one is what some people call dragon scale. It's an attempt at cutting at a 45 instead of at a 90. The biggest problem is once again, you can have weak spots. So this one I actually managed to snap while trying to uh, do this. And I really do think that's better to do this one with a chisel. At least that's what I'm gonna try next time. Um, there's another sample somewhere that's uh, uh, another one where I tried that, but they called it a uh, crocodile. And so you do the cuts, you do the twist, just like you do this one here, which to me already looks a little bit like a reptile scale. Uh -huh. But then you take it and you knock the corners down on it, and that gives it a nice smooth handle feel, but it also knocks and spreads those pieces out, and so it looks a bit more like a alligator skin or something like that. Let's see here. We should have it here. Let's make it out. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. So you can see right here before I broke it, that's where it was starting to kind of mushroom yeah, out. A little bit. And it makes it just a little bit smoother on the hand right there near the top, but down here, not so much. Um, here's another example of one of the other pieces, but you'll notice this one's tapered. Mm -hmm to go through. I'm, I was not the one that made this. I'm pretty sure what he did is he had a piece that he eventually broke or cut off that allowed him to twist down there in order to get that even look going. Um, this one's similar to what you saw with the others, but this is done on rectangle stock. So what, what is the end use for a lot of these? 
Uh, all of these are set to be different examples as conversation starters. Uh, I actually helped at the New Mexico Artist Blacksmiths Association and I did kind of thing on advanced twists where I was trying to talk about the different things that you can do. Uh, of course, you can find YouTube videos on all of these and more, but the benefit is when you actually try and hold something in your hand, like uh, some people call this the ribbon or the river twist. And it's just a way of reversing the twist and a lot of people see it but they don't quite understand how or why you make it this way and what this does is you have to isolate the heat so with our forge put the whole thing in the forge bring it out put this end in the vise grab here twist then put it back in the forge bring it out and then I would take it and co uh, quench or cool the part that I didn't want to move and then you moved it in the vise and twist it the other way, then reheat it. And I just kept going back and forth until I got it to kind of do this zigzag pattern, as you can see where it flows back in on itself. And this is a, a very nice or common one used on railings and uh, pulls, things like that. A lot of these get used in gates and that's where you see quite a few of them in accident examples. Um, also, handles and the uh, length between no. say where you have your ladle and your handle you have that long area you want to add a bit of decoration twists are a quick and easy way without adding any weight or anything to it awesome.